The fight against so-called Islamic State comes right to the heart of Europe. For the second time in a year, the streets of Paris are stained with blood as the world mourns the loss of 129 innocent lives, what can be done to keep us all safe? The famous Stade de France, proud symbol of a nation's sporting achievements and the first target of France's 9-11. A Friday the 13th, no one can forget. Paris under attack by multiple gunmen in multiple locations. Survivor Denis Plot spoke to me just meters from the Bataclan theater where he'd been on Friday night. At first we really thought it was a bad joke, like someone who wanted to spoil the show. A few seconds after, we heard uh, some uh, screams. Uh, I just let my instinct do the, the, the thing. I just uh, uh, run to the staircase and get inside a little room that made only 10 meters squares. I was followed by uh, like a bunch of uh, 12, 15 people. Just moments earlier, Denis and his friends had been enjoying the music of American rock band Eagles of Death Metal. It was completely crowded, like there was 1,500 people there, and most of them uh, at the ground floor. So um, I, I wanted to dance because uh, I love to dance. So I said, let's get upstairs and maybe save my life. Three terrorists with Kalashnikovs entered the venue. They started firing at random. Denis barricaded himself and 15 others, one seriously wounded, into a tiny back room. They listened helpless as the horror unfolded. So had you seen the terrorists at no, this stage? No, we just heard, for, during the whole thing, we heard the sound of their machine gun, which was really scary because we heard them shooting and then there was a silence the time that they reload their gun and then uh, no, the shooting during one hour and a half. Trapped, they frantically telephoned the police. And they say, OK, we arrive, but uh, it should take some time. So keep your calm and uh, don't open the door until the police arrive, uh, no matter how long it takes. Some girls uh, were frantic. They say, I don't want to die that way. But there was a remarkable uh, group spirit that all the people there, they succeeded in, into calming down the one who were breaking uh, down. The group cowered in silence for nearly three hours until finally they were led to safety by armed police. When we finally got uh, from the, um, the place, uh, we passed from uh, obscurity to light, full light. And what was in full light was corpse, was blood. It was a scene of war. <laughs> For the second time in less than a year, the spirit of this great city has been tested to its limits. France's year of terror started here in the quiet back streets of Paris, which were home to the offices of the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. 17 people died over three days. As the country mourned, defiant and determined Paris stood firm in the face of appalling tragedy. This time, though, the targets were chosen at random. The terrorists could have hit anyone, anywhere. So how could it happen again? How could they strike with even greater force? And what can France do next? The shock really is the, the scale of it. 
Um, we're, we didn't expect there to be such a level of sophistication uh, and such a high casualty rate. Usually such attacks are low level with low casualties. Um, and the use of suicide vests, for example, hasn't happened in Europe for some time now. And uh, really, this, is, this kind of development is inc incredibly concerning. In the days after the attack, the mood in Paris has been febrile. False alarms create panic and emotions run high. Dawn raids across France left two dead, including the alleged ringleader Abdelhamid Abou Oud. Dozens of suspects were taken into custody. The size of this terrorist cell, a chilling awakening. And as with Charlie Hebdo, many of the attackers were born and bred in the suburbs of Paris and cities of France. The national soul searching has begun. There's a number of things that ISIS would try and achieve with this kind of attack. Firstly, terrorism uh, is propaganda. It has a value on its own as an action. People are more aware of the organization or more aware of their political goals. This is a message for you, François Hollande. This is a message for all the inhabitants of France. Secondly, they're taking advantage of increased uh, community tensions in Europe and are looking to sort of sow further discord. The fear of future attacks will encourage more anti-migration and, unfortunately, probably anti-Muslim sentiment. Despite pockets of right-wing anti-Islamist protests like this in Lille on Saturday, so far the French have stayed broadly united. But this is a country which feels vulnerable on many fronts. Its location at the heart of mainland Europe, the free flow of people across its borders, and the legacy of post-war immigration from its colonies in Africa. Alain Marceau was head of counter-terrorism here in the 1980s. Now he's an opposition MP and harsh critic of government policy. This is a disaster for France, what has happened in Paris. It's necessary to wake up, but it's very difficult to wake up now. Today, I don't, I don't know what happened in this country. Are we now in the situation where it is impossible for France to keep its citizens safe? Yes, you are an island. I think it's good, it's good to be an island today. We are, we, are, we are an open country, open country everywhere, in the east, in the north, in the south. We are an open country, everybody come in France. On the streets of Paris, Muslim citizens are also struggling to make sense of the attacks carried out in the name of Islam. We are here naturally to denounce these acts of barbar and these attacks that absolutely nothing can justify. This coalition of imams came to pray and lay flowers at the scene of one of the shootings in a show of unity. Desperately searching for answers, a distraught Muslim woman expressed her fears about a growing generational divide. Nous leur répondons en leur disant Est-ce que toi tu as sauvé ta vie Est-ce que tu as sauvé ton âme de, Dieu ne t'a pas demandé d'être un bourreau. So we arrived here a few moments ago. A group of imams had come to pay their respects at the places where the terrorists struck on Friday night. And you can see within moments there are real uh, signs of anger and frustration breaking out just feet away from the flowers which have been laid here in the last couple of days. 
tempers were calmed by powerful words of peace and reconciliation from these religious leaders. I can right now speak on behalf of the Muslim family. We just came here to express our grief, to express our hurt, and to share these feelings with those who were first targeted because they were just human beings. Allah. I was invited by one of the imams to visit his mosque in a suburb of Paris to talk about ISIS, also known here as Daesh. Like so many I've met this week, his congregation were visibly shaken by events. Um, so what was your reaction to Friday night? Uh, we are uh, very, very sad uh, to uh, listen uh, in the radio and TV uh, this uh, action, this terrorist. And uh, we are very um, stupefied uh, that uh, Muslims do this uh, with our name. Yes. So uh, after when uh, we are see uh, it's, it's uh, Daesh, we are uh, saying uh, that uh, Daesh is not Muslim. And they killed, they killed pro, uh -huh. pro ch ch children. Our friends. Yeah. They, they kill our friends. Yeah. Our, our friends. It is in the marginalised suburbs of Paris that the fight for young Muslim hearts and minds will be won or lost. Around five million people of Muslim origin call France home. More have left to fight in Iraq and Syria than from any other country in Europe, an estimated 1,500. There are many young men yeah. who are being tempted to go to Syria. Uh, they say to the, to, to the young people, if you do this, you are going to, to, to paradise, you know? Mm. And most of the young people, mm. they didn't study, they didn't go to mm, high yeah. school. Uh, the problem, they are um, uh, a peu rejetés de la société. You understand? C'est-à-dire qu'ils ont, ils étaient perdus dans la société. So they've been uh, lost from society. Yes. Because, you see, the, the, the young, most of them, they, they were in prison, you know? Part of them. When they go outside of the prison, no work, no job, nothing. They don't come to the mosque. They, uh, they pray in a home and uh, with the same people. Then after they go to, to Syria. You know, the mosque have a very, very insignificant role in radicalizing the community. The real indoctrination is taking place on the social media, on the internet on Twitter and Facebook. This is, this is the, the, the real place for radicalism, a breeding place of radicalism all over the world, not just in the Western world. The internet connects people in Europe to hardcore jihadists in the Middle East and propagandists around the world. Um, it allows them to maintain contact and to really start feeling part of a larger movement, even if physically they're not there. They're able to use this sort of online persona that they create to make themselves feel part of this wider movement. And this can begin a process which can manifest itself finally in a more physical mobilization. If evidence were needed of the potent role of the internet in fueling 21st century terrorism, then here's some. This is a printout of an online conversation between a British jihadi in Syria and an undercover journalist here in London just this summer. In it, the jihadi instructs the journalist how to make a bomb and how to launch an attack on a military parade. Thankfully, the attack never happened and the journalist passed this information to the police. The US claim the British jihadi was then killed in a US drone strike. But just how many other conversations are being held like this online? They have about 50,000 accounts on Twitter alone. They, have, they tweet 100,000 tweets every day. Maybe you can destroy, um, you know, say 20,000 uh, uh, accounts today. But tomorrow, it, you know, immediately, it, they will be replaced like a hydra monster. You cut one head and then, you know, the five sprung. Here in the UK, much has been made of our greater community cohesion. But more work is undoubtedly needed and meaningful engagement with young Muslims has never been so important. With the help of government funding, it's what they're trying to do at this centre in East London. This is our youth centre, we call it a change centre. It's where we, we get young people, look at pool tables, table tennis, 
these are all tools of engagement, you know. The kids think it's all free, it's not, because part of the, uh, the signing up here is that you sign a contract, you can come in and use the facilities, but you've got to contribute to our workshops. What's happened in Paris uh, is a stark reality of what could happen here at a moment's notice. Hanif Kadir understands better than most the path to radicalization. He was once part of an Al-Qaeda network. Now he works with young Muslims to engage them with the community and keep them away from extremism. Because extremist groups and, and terrorists out there understand the hearts and minds of our young people, um, and they, 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 they provide the solutions to their grievances. When we have a breakdown in cohesion, that pushes young men and women further towards the solution that the extremists are offering. And as a result, you're going to get extremism. And that's going to lead to terrorism. Hanif Kadir believes that despite the number of young Britons being drawn towards IS, young Muslims across the channel have a far greater sense of grievance. There's no comparison with regards to France and England, in that sense. There's a lot of ghettoization going on over there. A lot of internal grievances have been harbored historically. We haven't got that, the banning of the hijab. You know, the, the, you can't even practice your faith you know, openly, like you can in the UK. But he says Britain cannot be complacent. There is still much to do to stop young Britons being radicalized. We've got to make sure that we get all the young people involved in, and prepared for the campaign that we're going to be launching very soon. And in the wake of the Paris attack, he and his team are redoubling their efforts. Although we want to run an effective uh, and a powerful campaign, we also want to put two fingers in the eyes of ISIS. He argues that government could benefit from listening more carefully to the views of young Muslims who are keen to be part of the debate. Without cohesion, we have nothing. If David Cameron opened up and said, you know what, guys, he's my hand. I extend it to you in, in friendship, in support. I need you, you on board. Help me shape this country. Help me protect our shores. Help me fix this problem. And I can guarantee you one thing. I'd be very surprised if the community didn't put their hands up and say, you know what, I'm on board. This is Luton, a town of 200,000 people, one in four of whom is Muslim. Police chiefs say in communities like this, it's crucial to have officers on the ground who can identify and disrupt extremists. While the government has pledged to invest heavily in intelligence gathering, police say money is being taken away from vital work in communities. The initial intelligence, the initial information, that start of the story about somebody who causes a concern is far more likely to come from a local community officer from local neighbourhoods than it is from um, any analytical work um, from people working for the security services. In July, a family of 12 left Luton to join IS in Syria. In the same month, a local man was charged with plotting a terror attack. I think there is some concerns with police officers that in some of those communities where there are risks of extremism, we simply haven't got sufficient officers. We've got a thinner blue line and we haven't got the resources to do that preventative work. In the aftermath of the Paris attacks, life has to go on. Public spaces like this Christmas market in Birmingham will draw big crowds in the coming weeks. We could have gone to London this week, like today, instead, couldn't we? And I mm -hmm. thought, no way. Because I just think they're going <laughs> to start shooting somewhere else. It does make you think all the time, doesn't it? If we let people who want to murder innocent people get us down, then we will let the terrorists win. Harry Abdi Collins is a security expert and former paratrooper. He says that the proliferation of CCTV in Britain is a vital tool in uncertain times, where a terror attack could strike anywhere at any time. Well, I think the key is that the attack, the modus uh, operandi of the uh, attackers has changed. and They've gone to softer targets and public open areas. We have CCTV uh, on a larger scale than the French, um, and that would lend itself to a faster response and perhaps a more comprehensive response. Many of us now accept the widespread use of monitoring and surveillance of our public spaces. But this is now likely to be extended to areas of our lives we once considered private, as security forces try to track the activities of IS through social media and the internet. The recent missions by the security services here show that a, a lot of traffic is already monitored. But it is a constant game of catch-up 
between those who want to monitor and those who want to evade detection, who of course are, are not just uh, terrorists, but other people who are very focused on privacy. So there'll be a, a constant kind of technological contest to outrun each other. Just before the attacks in France, the House of Commons debated new rules to increase the monitoring powers of British security services. But with this came questions about how many of our freedoms we're willing to give up in return for our safety. Our societies are now faced with, with quite a dilemma. Um, on the one hand, we want to prevent attacks like this, and on the other, we want to maintain and preserve our current civil liberties. So we have to decide now, um, are we willing to cede some of these civil liberties for security, or are we willing to maintain this level of threat um, for the sake of preserving these civil liberties? And this is going to be an ongoing debate and discussion that we must uh, really undertake. Charlie! In the aftermath of the Charlie Hebdo attacks, France introduced some of the most draconian surveillance laws in Europe. But even these were not enough to stop the terrorists. What is clear is that among the first casualties of terrorism are the freedoms we've come to enjoy. Alain Marceau argues that one of the freedoms that should now be sacrificed is the open border policy between the 22 EU countries that signed up to the Schengen Agreement. This includes France and Belgium, but not Britain. Is it time to forget Schengen, to close all of the borders in Europe? Yes, I explained to the Prime Minister. I said uh, we are unable to, to protect our, our citizen and we can make, we can take such a decision to make, to, to recover borders. This wouldn't just mean border checks for citizens passing from one country to another, it would also make it far more difficult for refugees making the desperate journey from Africa and the Middle East. All people with a, a, a heart large like this, come on, come on, guy, come on, oh, it's come on in my home. But they come also with a, with a, with a gun, with a Kalashnikov. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. But people would say that's making refugees who genuinely need a safe place a scary prospect. And politically, that's quite dangerous. I think, I think the generosity will, uh, will be finished for France and perhaps for other countries in, in Europe. But what about liberté, égalité and fraternité? What about fraternité in France? Give, give me a lamp to find fraternity. No, fraternity is broken. All the known attackers were European citizens. And so this focus on refugees and on borders that we're hearing is entirely misplaced. The homegrown threat is just not something that can really be protected against by scapegoating refugees. In Britain, the tone is increasingly bullish, with David Cameron expected to make the case in Parliament for joining the fight against IS in Syria. In so doing, the country would be joining a growing coalition of countries determined to crush IS. The Islamic State would love to see boots at the ground. And I am not surprised, you know, they are doing, you know, Paris bombing, Paris at deadly attacks, vicious attacks in order to enrage the French government to send troops at the ground, to enrage the West to send troops in the ground. And from the Middle East to Russia and the United States, there is a growing horror at the targeting of innocent civilians. Be it the Shia community in Beirut, holidaymakers returning from Sharm el-Sheikh, or those out and about in Paris, or the hundreds of thousands of civilians killed in Syria and Iraq. And how do you feel now, Denis? Will you ever feel safe in your city again? As soon as the Bataclan uh, opens, uh, his door again, uh, I, I will be there, back. And even if uh, I know that the, the place will have been cleaned, I, I will st still see the ghost and the blood. But uh, I think it's important, you know, like uh, when you, uh, you are riding your bicycle and you fall, you have to go again on it. This time last week, young people across Paris, just as in cities across the UK, were making plans for their Friday night out. A bite to eat, a laugh, maybe see a band. What happened next has scarred this city forever. And in the busy run-up to Christmas, as we think about our lives and our security, it has clearly left a mark on all of us.
on Axe Tonight is a worrying wait for Ashley's diagnosis. We're back in Emmerdale.